John and Brad, tremendous thanks for joining me here. And we come together, as you both well know, at a time when there seems to be a lot of division, a lot of divisiveness. And it seems a lot of it has to do with people's thoughts and feelings about freedom and about the proper role of government. And specifically, you have different thoughts around whether we should have free markets on the one hand or more of a mixed economy on the other, laissez-faire capitalism or more government involvement. And John Allison, you, you've held quite a number of posts, one of them as the president of bb and the only top 10 bank in 2008 that did not need did not need a bailout during the meltdown. And you brought the valuation in about your 23 years or so at the helm there from under $5 billion to over $150 billion. You also have headed the Kano Institute, may be the preeminent free market think tank, and you're a professor at Wake Forest for business school students. And Brad DeLong, you also have spent some time in school. You started out at Harvard as an undergrad, got mm -hmm. your master's, graduated summa cum laude, did your PhD all in economics, and now you teach economics at UC Berkeley. You've held some fairly prominent posts. You were the Deputy Associate Treasury Secretary under Clinton. You've held a number of posts, but you also know a thing or two about economic theory. You wrote the textbook on economic theory. So I can hardly imagine two people better poised to really grapple with the issue at hand today, which once again is on the one hand, Sean Allison, you're coming out in defense of free market capitalism, and Brad, you in defense of a mixed economy. Now, one of the things I've observed, we've all observed, I'm sure, is the markets bring a specialization of labor. And our viewers are CEOs and leaders who are specialized on building their organizations. So, regrettably, a lot of them haven't had as much time to think about the kind of system that enables the prosperity they're all benefiting from. My goal here today is that you two are going to help illuminate what actually is the right system. What's the right system for governance? And what's going to ultimately, for these leaders who are building our future, what's something they can do to help bring about the future they want? And Brad, as you fade into and out of the Vatican, it's definitely <laughs> going to, to create an interesting diversion, but it's about as, as good a diversion as I can imagine. Before we dive in, I want to thank both of you for your courage, really, and, and your willingness to bring this discussion to the public square. So let's get on into it. And if I can, John, invite you to start us off. What do you think makes capitalism and free markets so good? Well, Josh, let me, let me kind of give you background before I try to answer that specific question. Please. As you said, I was a longtime CEO of bb and We uh, had a phenomenal success. We grew from four and a half billion to $150 billion, became the 10th largest financial institution in the U.S., went through the financial crisis without a single quarterly loss. Almost nobody did that. And it was because of our philosophy, not because we had any grand operating ideas. Our philosophy was grounded really in Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, although technically it was not objectivism, it was more libertarian style philosophy. When I left bb and I became CEO of Cato. <clears throat> and I'll give you my background or my uh, elevator speech on Cato. <clears throat> Cato is the world's leading libertarian organization. Its mission is to create a free and prosperous society based on the principles of individual liberty, free markets, limited government, and peace. We really do believe in limited government. We think the government ought to stay out of your pocketbook. We also think it ought to stay out of your bedroom. Uh, we think government has a very important role, and that's to protect individual rights. It's to keep me from using force or fraud to take what you've earned, and to keep you from using force or fraud to take what I've earned. In that context, government has three basic responsibilities. National defense to protect us from bad guys overseas, <clears throat> police to protect us from bad guys in our neighborhood, <clears throat> and a court system so that when you and I have a legitimate dispute, we can resolve it without resort to force. In our ideal world, there'd be 95% less regulations and far more effective courts. The reason <clears throat> that we think that government needs to be limited it has awesome power. It is potentially extraordinarily dangerous. You know, Walmart can offer you special deals, low prices, try to incense you to buy their products, but they can't make it. The government can make it. They can uh, put you in jail. They can take your property. They can shoot you. In fact, throughout history, governments have killed millions of people. Millions of people. Government is potentially very dangerous. 
Um, therefore, we think it's very important that government, quote, be controlled. And the next time you hear something that you maybe like the outcome, but it, if government had to do it and had to use force to do it, we would say don't do it. <laughs> because as the use of force is very potentially dangerous, except in the act of self-defense. Um, in that context, we are primarily advocates of human reasoning, of the human mind. Uh, we believe there's only one true natural resource, that is the human mind. Uh, man's ability to think. We think it's been a wasted resource for a long time. <laughs> if you look for hundreds of thousands of years from the evolution of Homo sapiens, really, to the late 1700s, very little progress. And then something happened in the late 1700s that ended up transforming the quality of life on this planet. It was called the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, uh, science, technology, uh, but also freedom freedom of thought, and ultimately the free enterprise system. Um, if you think about human progress, human progress is only possible when someone innovates, when someone sees something different than other people have seen, when someone thinks differently. So all human progress is based on innovation and creativity. And innovation and creativity is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot be innovative, not be creative, cannot contribute to human progress. That's why we are primarily advocates of entrepreneurship and of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs take the ideas of scientists and engineers and turn them into reality. Without entrepreneurship, there's literally no progress. And what characterizes entrepreneurs? First, they're experimenters. They fail a lot. For every Google, there's 10,000 failed Googles. For every Walmart, there's 100,000 failed Walmarts. Uh, most entrepreneurs never make it. I'd say probably 999 out of 1,000 you never hear of because they never, they, they never make it. They're experimenters. <clears throat> they fail. A few, a few achieve. They're out-of-the-box thinkers in the sense that they see things that other people simply can't see and don't see. When I was in college, if somebody had shown me an iPhone with all the technology it has in it today and told me what it could do, I'd have thought that was bizarre. You know, I would have thought maybe in 100 years, we'll have some machine that can do this. I don't know how Steve Jobs saw an iPhone. I don't know where that came from. It's an amazing insight that's had a huge effect on human well being. So, entrepreneurship is the source of all human progress. But entrepreneurship is only possible for free people, for somebody that can see things differently and can explore and fail and take the responsibility and get the reward for those, those, those successes and those failures. And so we are, as, as libertarians, we are primarily advocates of freedom. We're primarily advocates of ent entrepreneurship. We think it's very important the government be limited in that regard. Now I'm going to flip and then I'll pass it over. I want to flip to the a current subject because I think it's relevant to this discussion. And that's the whole issue of how we've been handling COVID-19. I think it's a very interesting issue. Uh, first, let me tell you, I was on two governmental commissions uh, to look at the facts in regards to COVID-19. Very sophisticated people, lots of research, very smart. And what's interesting about COVID-19, it is for people under 65 that don't have health problems, it is no more dangerous, argumentatively less dangerous than the flu. You would never know that from reading the newspaper. You think it's the worst disease of all time. It is nowhere near the worst disease of all time. <clears throat> for people over 65, and or people that have health conditions, it, it is a relatively dangerous disease. Although the average age of the people that have died from COVID-19 is 80 years old, 80 years old. So it's mostly an old person's disease and most of the people have some other serious health issues while they die from COVID-19. So here's the interesting question. What have we done to our economy? What have we done to opportunity for young people by closing down the economy in the way we have. In a libertarian society, 
we would have had the facts presented. Maybe the government would have acted in certain areas like closing down rest homes that have you know, special characteristics. And, and, and you can argue there was, there'd be an emergency about that, but you certainly wouldn't have closed the schools. You certainly wouldn't have closed the industry. And our standard of living would be higher and our future would be brighter. And I really worry about the kids that six, seven, eight years old, they're not getting the normal education because we closed the school systems. We've had an incredible abuse of power by gov governors, by state legislatures, and I would argue, based on what the statistics we saw, if anything, we probably increased the death rate. We certainly increased the number of people who got the disease. And, and instead of letting people act consistent with their own beliefs based on much better knowledge than we have now, uh, that we have now. So, you know, I think that for those of us that believe in a free society, the role of government's important in, in the protection of individual rights. And that's a non-trivial, very important thing to do. But it's easy for it to be abused. And it's easy for people to become power lusters. And when given the opportunity, and I think COVID-19 is a classic example of, of a lot of politicians given, the, given the, the opportunity to lust for power and act accordingly and do an enormous amount of damage to objectively. And I, I'm certain that 20 years from now, when they go back and look at the facts, they're gonna say, wow, we'd have been a lot better off not doing nine out of the 10 things that the government did during this period of time. So Josh, that's mixing a couple of things together, but I think you get the spirit of where I'm, I'm coming from. The ingredients come together to bake a very distinctive cake. And that cake is of a very particular flavor. Brad, I'm guessing that as you come out in advocacy of a, a mixed economy, you'll have a somewhat different flavor to the cake. Let's, let's hear your perspective on why a mixed economy is preferable and a bit of background if you'd like as well. John, thanks for sharing all that background with us. Let me see. You know, right now, there are 7.8 billion of us on the globe compared to perhaps say 15 million of us some 5,000 years ago when we first started writing things down. Um, our average person, right, there's thus only one 500th as much land you know, now as there was then to raise the crops and to herd the beasts that will feed the average person. Yet our material standard of living now, our material standard of living today worldwide, um, and it's even though it's vastly, vastly, extraordinarily unequally and inequitably distributed as it is, um, it averages at least 15. And perhaps I think more like 50 times as much as it did back then. How is it that we can be so rich on so much smaller a per capita resource base? You know, because of our science, um, because of our technology, because of the incentives people have had not just to develop but to deploy technology, and because of the extremely fine societal division of labor needed to make our technology maximally productive. You know, and our division of labor is exceedingly, um, ludicrously fine. Right? That the standard example is it takes 60 people to make and distribute a pencil and that there is nobody in the world who knows how to do all of the operations that are done to make a normal standard pencil. And that 60 is with all the knowledge and machines and organizations already set up. Now, in order to successfully and productively manage the division of labor, you know, we need a market economy. It, we need to have property. We need things to have owners who decide what is to be done with them so that decision-making can be properly pushed out to the periphery, um, to the place where the information actually is. We need to have exchange so that resources can be delivered to where they're most productive. Um, we need to have money so that people can be properly incentivized to direct their resources to productive uses. Um, we need to have large firms 
because there's an awful lot of production where once you've figured out what you need to do, you really don't need to have every single piece of it go through a market transaction. You need to set up some kind of hierarchical thing rather than having, say, the CEO of a large bank have to bargain every day with his potential vice presidents as to whether they will work for him today or go off and work for something else today. Um, but even where we have these, what you know, um, Henry Simons called these very large islands of central planning in a market economy, they remain efficient only if they remain competitive and only if they are under market pressure. And we need to have contract laws and courts because efficient economic arrangements are not totally composed of one shot cash on the barrel head transient exchanges between counterparties who never deal with one another again. You know, and indeed in recognizing this and in setting all of this out in the middle of the 20th century, Friedrich von Hayek showed his absolute genius, which is why I put his picture up when I teach Econ 1. And there are lots of examples. So, you know, there's the pencil. Um, my favorite example, the one I'm using most right now, of the power and the utility of the market comes from 4th century BC Athens. Um, where the boule and the demos thought it good to build a 30-foot high bronze statue of Athene Promachos, um, the goddess Athena fighting in front, that would be visible from the sea as far as 60 miles away, as far as Soyunian head at the southern tip of Attica. Um, it needed 90 tons of bronze. In order to make 90 tons of bronze, you need nine tons of, kin, of tin. There was lots of copper in Greece, there was no tin, and nobody in Athens had any idea where in the world nine tons of tin could be found. The historian Herodotus wandered around asking people, where is this tin going to come from? And absolutely nobody knew. No, but the market knew. And when the price of tin in the marketplace in Athens went up, people began to, to carry tin there from all over the Mediterranean and beyond. Um, by simply setting one signal out to the world that tin is valuable in Attica right now. The people of Athens crowdsourced the problem of where do we find the tin to make the bronze alloy to build our statue. And the market knew the answer. Um, no individual person knew. None of the miners in Cornwall who ultimately mined the tin knew for what purpose the tin they mined was wanted or how valuable its ultimate, use, ultimate users would find it. But the market knew, and so it happened. Yeah, but markets fail. Um, you know, when I teach Econ 1, I try to run through a list of how markets fail, and I think right now I'm up to 10 separate and different ways. That if markets are not very delicately tuned and regulated, um, then they won't be able to move resources to where they can find their most societally beneficial uses. And they can produce and do produce absolute horror shows. For this, let me give you two examples. Um, first is OxyContin, right? We've now lost 100,000 dead from OxyContin and related overdoses here in the United States. Why? Um, because Purdue Pharmaceuticals found it could make a great deal of money by pushing it out through the distribution channels. Never mind whether, given how many of us have brains that cannot manage the opiate feedback loop, we all would not have been much better off you know, without it, using other painkillers. But Purdue wasn't going to make that decision. And the fact that Purdue was simply a corporation employing people and interacting them with market exchange made it easy for them to make that decision. That I guarantee you that every single Purdue executive would have reacted with horror if you'd said, you know, here's $4 billion in profits from this branch of pharmaceuticals over the next 20 years. Um, but here's a gun, you have to start shooting people and you have to shoot 100,000 of them before you're through. Purdue wasn't going to make that decision any more than RJR would ever argue that tobacco caused too much lung cancer or Exxon that leaded gasoline produced too much brain damage. 
that when you reduce transactions to market transactions, cash on the barrel head exchanges, and you strip all the social context away from it, you do absolutely great and wonderful things. Right? That there is no relationship at all between the miner in Cornwall on the one hand and the metal workers in Athens on the other. They really don't need to communicate. They don't need to be friends. They just need to be useful to each other. And they could do absolutely great things for the city of Athens in 350 BC. But when you do strip away the social context, so the only way you interact with people is through market exchanges, um, you open the world to an awful lot of potential horror shows. In this particular case, because those who are going to get addicted to OxyContin and die um, do not know enough about their own psychology, that opiates are something that they should avoid genuinely like the plague. And the second example, right? Here we have the Bengal famine of 1942 and 1943. You know, the Japanese carrier strike force, Kido Butai, was then stocking the Indian Ocean. It was World War II. There were then no exports from Bengal by sea, so there was no employment in the jute and cotton plantations of Bengal that year because nothing was going out. And there was a war in Burma and huge demand for the allied armies fighting in Burma that needed to be fed. And so food was redirected eastward from Bengal from these people here who have no money because they have no jobs because the jute plantations have shut down to um, Mountbatten's armies in Burma that have money and are willing to pay through the nose um, to be fed. Now, um, there was plenty of food in India. The food in India was an easy railway journey away. But without work in the export industries, there were three million people who had no money and without any alternative sources of employment. And how do you employ three million people with three million people who are used to working in jute plantations in a very poor agricultural area in 1942-1943 when there's a world war on? You know, the market system simply did not register that their hunger was a need. Um, to the market, their hunger was not a need because the market recognizes not need and demand, but only effective need and effective demand. And with no money that to put some flesh on so you can't see the ribs of the five-year-old in about a month before he died, um, that was not something the market was gonna solve. And so they died. Um, the idea that the market does not have to be intervened with and unregulated. It's really not something that professional economists have ever taught. You know, that I was browsing the internet this morning um, and came up with this quote from one of the very first of the British classical economists, J.R. McCulloch in 1848, in his essay on a treatise to the succession to property vacant by death, um, in which He's calling for substantial government intervention into the property order um, in the case of the transfer of property. And he says, the principle of laissez-faire, um, that leave the market unloaned and unregulated, may be trusted to in some things, but there are many more it is wholly inapplicable. And to appeal to it on all occasions savors more of the policy of a parrot. Um, than of a statesman or of a philosopher. You know, John Maynard Keynes wrote in 1926, it's not so much a doctrine that economists teach as rather what journalists, and I think also sometimes plutocrats, think that economists should teach and claim falsely that they do teach. Um, that a well-functioning economy that produces human happiness and human freedom um, will be a mixed economy. Um, the only question is how you manage to put things into the mix. And do we want to turn this into a COVID-19 seminar or not? 
I guess that's my chance to, to chime in though, John, you'll certainly have perspective. Um, I, I'd say, let this flow where you two wanted to, and I'd love to invite you to cross-examine and share questions, but if I can poke right. and jab well, a little bit. No, 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 have no, another question no, here? no, no. If we're going there, we're showing this graph. Australia is not a place that is unfree. Human freedom in Australia is as great as the United States. And right now, the economy in Australia is in significantly better shape than the United States. And how many deaths does Australia have from COVID-19? Australia has managed to stop the virus because it did the normal and reasonable things, which means to say that they do not believe that if you breathe an infectious and potentially deadly virus onto people, that is your natural right. Um, they believe that if you're unlikely to be infected with COVID-19, you go home, stay home, and if you won't stay home, you go to a quarantine hotel. They believe it is very, very important to test and trace everyone who shows up with the disease because there are 48 hours before you're symptomatic in which you're shedding lots of virus and potentially killing people. And, you know, um, our normal kind of simply isolate those who are symptomatic, you know, just doesn't work with this disease. That yes, those who die are primarily over 80, although one of my wife's 24 year old students staying damned close. Um, she had lupus, or she has lupus, which means that she has some health problems, but is looking forward to living a normal life. Um, I don't know if she'll ever make a full recovery from COVID-19. She certainly came very close to the edge of death, kind of three times. Um, we let this thing rip um, through the country. Um, if we'd let this thing rip through the country between March, April, May, and June, we'd have had 200 million cases. Um, we'd have had collapses in our healthcare system, which is not equipped to handle so many. Um, we'd have had about 3 million people dead. Um, and I actually don't think we'd have a healthier economy now than we actually have. Certainly it is infinitely better to have actually been Australia and to have had a competent president rather than a total idiot um, in control of our public health measures and taken the standard normal public health measures that Australia and New Zealand have taken, that Hong Kong has taken, that Japan has taken. None of them are totalitarian hellholes of unfreedom, but they all had a president who other than Donald Trump was not in the business of telling people lies. All right, with, with that, quite an opening. And <clears throat> John, as I mentioned, and Brad, as I mentioned, I'd love to invite you guys to ask questions of each other. But if, if I can dive in with one, it sounds like one of the key points, Brad, you're making is that the mixed economy is important because in a free market, one, we have productivity challenges. Companies will fail. And we also have a humanitarian challenge people will end up in a, a terrible place. Um, on the productivity side, I, I think maybe we can steer away a bit more because my guess is that's less juicy of a conversation and people would tend to agree a bit more. You look at like the post office, right? It's lost a, an extra billion or two each year. And somehow when a government operation loses money, it gets more money where in the marketplace, if a company loses money, it just goes bankrupt. And I think you could see to that point, John, you get 100,000 failures for every Walmart, right? But somehow things still work out. People get a new job. If we can perhaps focus on the humanitarian side, which sounds like it's a more charged side and perhaps a, a, even a more plausible claim. John, you want to start off there? What's better for people and what's better in alleviating all that suffering? That's a great question. <laughs> I wanted to respond a little bit to what Brad said, though, just if you don't mind. Uh, first, you know, the opioids were approved by the FDA. 
they spent 10 years being approved by the FDA. So the government approved. You think that decision was right? No, I think it was wrong. My point okay. is. Okay, all right. So we need a better FDA, more effective FDA. Or maybe we don't need an FDA and that people. All right. So if, it did, if you have no FDA, they would not have, there would have been no way to non approve them. And we would not have had zero. We would have had more Purdue's. You're just not making any sense. Either you say we need a better FDA that intervenes more effectively, or you say, well, it's just, it was um, too bad that the people who got addicted and died did not understand the potential risks. Pick one or the other. Well, don't, not say government, don't say government is bad, and we don't say the FDA should have regulated it properly, and we should have no FDA. What I say is if there wasn't an FDA, there would be other private agencies. What? There is an electric what ones. How many people get killed by electricity? <laughs> you under average laboratory for 50, 100 years. It's been underwriting electrical curves. You don't see stuff burned down. I say there would be private FDA that would be far, far superior to the government FDA. So you, you, you're, 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 you're saying the only alternatives to government are none. I say that, that private enterprise would step in and the people that knew how to do this right would, get, would gain market share just like they do in every other business. Why, why wouldn't, wouldn't the people that are better at regulating drugs become the dominant player? And, and then your example of starvation. How do they make, how do they make their money? They charge a fee to, 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 to underwrite. Uh, hey, I, I've got, I've got, a, I got, a, I got a friend at Moody's. Yeah. And since you were at the epicenter of the banking crisis, John, back in 08 and, and the years leading up to it, what role did the regulators play, the Fitch, the S&P, the Moody's, either in... Moody's banking, is in, not a regulator. Moody's is the private agency that he's calling for. The problem with Moody's was that they had very strong incentives to rate as triple A assets that aren't triple A. When you have a private agency going in and pretending to take on the job of information regulation, they have a powerful incentive to burn their knowledge and credibility to gain profits now, as we saw back in the subprime crisis when all of these things that private regulators had identified as AAA turned out not to be so. Well, in the first place, they aren't truly private. They're highly regulated. Oh, ho, 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 ho. How can so everything that fails is limited. You can't, you can't open up another rating agency. I've been there. I can tell you that's true. Uh, and B, a lot of people like bb and we didn't buy those bonds. People bought them. But Moody's fault was the people that were dumb enough not to read the information. <laughs> they made a mistake. Uh, and they got killed. And they shouldn't have been bailed out by the government. They should have. They should have suffered the losses. And Moody should. Now, have I, I'm, John, I'm an, I'm an outsider here, but my understanding was there was some pressure from what was not private and not government, but more like a cartel that had special government granted privileges to be a rating agency. Exactly. And if they didn't rate with a certain level, triple A or near that, they they actually would have lost a lot of that privilege. You're right, Josh. It was a government created cartel. It was not, he's not, Moody's fish standard reports are not private. Brad, what, Brad, what's your sense for that? Was it really a private player from your perspective? They definitely were not acting like government regulators were. They definitely were acting like people who want to get more business from their private sector clients by doing what the private sector clients wanted them to do and then taking home the money. You know, there so was, question, quit. What yeah. was it? Ned Gramlin, took, Ned Gramlin at the Federal I, Reserve um, wanted a lid put on subprime um, in 2003, 2004, 2005. You know, he was the government. The rest of the Republican run government kind of did not agree. Now, if you want to say that private agents can provide all the information that the economy needs and if a private agent fails then it's not really private and that the market is perfect and the market can never fail the market can only be failed and you know it's the fault of the i don't know 
say the fault of the workers in the you know, auto factories of Detroit, that too many people who they sold cars into um, worked for companies that had gotten their financing from banks that had not looked at the fine print and had not understood that when Moody's said that these things were about as good as US treasuries, it did not really mean it. Um, if you want to say that, we're just not having a productive conversation. That either you want to say that the government has to play, should play a role in regulating the economy, or you're going to let things rip. And you can't say that institutions that people have never seen in the real world develop and maintain themselves for any long period of time will suddenly and magically appear to fulfill all of the good things that government does while avoiding doing any of the bad things. The government already existed. They were regulating sand for millions and fish. The government regulation is so good. <laughs> Why didn't they keep them from doing this crazy stuff? You know, uh, Brad, I, it, was that people, that was because, it was because people like you were telling George W. Bush's people that the really important thing was to cut back on the red tape of financial regulation. I wasn't telling him anything. We, we, don't, we didn't oh. use my, my Moody's Standard Poor's or Fish because we had sense enough. We knew that they made I recall money. lots of Cato people. I recall lots of Cato people writing lots of op-eds, kind of talking about how it was important not to over-regulate the derivatives market. Well, I wasn't working for Cato then. I was running BB. Okay. No, 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 no. And I don't, if you I don't want to sell yourself. If you want to sell yourself as an ex-Cato president, um, you got to take some responsibility I, and I say that I would already. not get there. Uh, all right, all right. Let's, John. John, yeah. let's jump back to the question on the humanitarian side. Uh, so, when we look at some of the catastrophes and the role that, that free markets have played through the evolution of humankind. How do you think that, that free markets have helped or hurt the situation? Well, you're talking about in general? Uh, from a humanitarian side, when you think from about death and suffering and starvation and all these things, maybe to broaden the question, we, what system has helped lift more people out of poverty? Is it a mixed economy? Is it free markets? Give us an angle from the humanitarian side. Well, I mean, Brad wants to use Cato stuff. We have a humanprogress.org website that's got all this information in it. I mean, tons and tons of numbers. And what we've seen is an exponential improvement in human well-being. The single biggest thing is correlated with is freedom. Freer markets lead to higher human well-being. The second thing that's correlated with is the use of energy. Those two factors, there are other factors, but those two factors are driving an incredible improvement in the quality of life and life expectancy. Not more government regulations. <laughs> you can't correlate any of the improvement with more government regulations. In fact, if there is any correlation, it's the other way around, although that's a hard correlation to make. But I just say go to Cato's website on humanprogress.org. The facts are there, the numbers are there. They're government numbers. <laughs> and what it shows is less government regulation, less interference in markets, and more use of energy raises standard of living an unbelievable increase in the standard of living. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing improvement in human well-being, and it's happening everywhere on the globe. Freer uh, are getting much, much wealthier, and people are getting much, much wealthier. And by the way, the difference in the standard of living is closing. There's still a big difference, but it is a lot less than it used to be. And there's kind of, you know, if you live in Bangladesh, $300 a year may not sound like much, but it's a difference between being starving and eating. And so in a lot of the very poorest countries, the rise in the standard of living is life and death. And I just say, go to humanprogress.org. We got all the numbers and we got tons of numbers there. And it's, it's clear freedom. People, because it leads to innovation and creativity, leads to free trade, leads to better use of resources, uh, at least tapping into the human capital that even poor countries have. Freedom works. So, so, so it sounds like, apart from the statistics, Brad, you mentioned some, some anecdotes. 
If we shift from anecdotes to perhaps statistics, what's the case for a mixed economy helping from a humanitarian side? Well, you know, the fastest growing um, economy the world has ever seen has been China's economy over the past 40 years, um, which is a very weird beast. It's definitely not a laissez-faire free market organization okay, that I like to call it state capitalism with Chinese characteristics and egalitarian um, aspirations or perhaps hopes. But, you know, they definitely have a strong role for the market. Um, they definitely do not want to drown their government in the bathtub. The second fastest has been Japan. Close behind Japan are the four Asian tigers, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan. All of these, you know, plus Germany, plus the United States and its Hamiltonian moods, um, plus post post World War II growth episodes of Western Europe, the most impressive cases of economic growth the world has seen have been accompanied by the strongly interventionist developmental states um, that you can trace back to Alexander Hamilton and to his initial writings back in 1790s as first secretary of the treasury. So, so Brad, the question, question is, is that a correlation or is there cause? Because you, you mentioned innovation gets spurred on by these things. You both brought up innovation. Now, yeah. when you think about things like the wheel, the plane, the car, the electric bulb, refrigerators, phones, you name it, penicillin, these were all privately devised inventions. Where does the notion that innovation and growth is going to get facilitated or accelerated by government coming from? Oh, well, for one thing, the government had to create the corporate form, you know, that before we had the modern corporation, um, you know, you had inventors. But an inventor also had to be a financier, an impresario, a human resource manager, a marketer, um, nine different things. But once you get the corporation up and running, once you get the industrial research lab, um, then Thomas Edison can actually spend his time doing the things that Thomas Edison is good at. And, you know, a crazy genius loon like Nikola Tesla can actually find himself a slot in the Westinghouse Electrical um, Manufacturing Company and be highly productive and personally advance the progress of electricity by 15 years simply because he knew how to make alternating current get up and dance. Mm -hmm. So, John, it sounds like, like you argue for limited government, but some enough to perhaps protect property rights and create that kind of corporate shell. How much government is necessary in order to enable the creation of an entity like a corporation? Well, I think you need a meaningful government. I, I'm not one of the people who thinks you can do without government. I think that would be crazy. I think it'd lead to chaos. I think the government has th th these three basic roles. Uh, one is to protect us from forces overseas, <laughs> or it'd be the Nazis, the Japanese in World War II or whatever. Maybe the Chinese, uh, Brad, so high, we'll see. You have to have police. I, I thought a call a foul. I am not high on the Chinese government or on the Chinese regime. I did not say I was. Oh, okay. Please withdraw that. Uh, okay, I'll withdraw it. I thought you Okay, said. withdraw. I'll withdraw. All right, withdrawn. Go on. Okay. Anyway, we need, we need a, a military to protect us from bad guys overseas, like the Nazis and the Japanese in World War II. We need a police force so that people don't go robbing each other. And we need a court system so that we have legitimate disputes we can settle them without resort to violence. I think courts are incredibly important. I think we could dramatically improve our court system if we had clear rule of law. I think rule of regulation is very dangerous, having tried to run a company with the regulations float around all over the place and change with the whims uh, with the president or whoever's uh, in charge and you don't know what the regulations really are. I think that's really destructive to our, to our economy. So I, I think you need, this is an important role of government and, it, and it, it's about basically protecting individual rights. It's, it's yeah, cool. keeping me from using force of fraud one way or the other uh, from taking what you own and, and you taking what I own. 
And of course, you need structures around that, such as corporations. I, you know, a corporation to me is not, it's, it's just an agreement. It's an agreement that says this is how, you know, we're going to operate. And this is, and these are the rules in which this kind of entity operates. And you certainly need that kind of rule of law. So, I, I, you know, I think there's an important role for government, but I think government's way above its role. I think anybody that's had to work with a lot of these government agencies, as I did for a long period of time, knows that they are very, very destructive and very oriented towards their own agendas instead of what, what most people and what probably their own leadership would call the public good. How do you come to have your views? You sometimes hear these differences like, you know, market economy or free markets. And on the one hand, it sounds just like a, a different, a single different idea. I wonder if there's more to it when we look under the surface, if there are some deeper, deeper differences, some other worldviews or beliefs that are really at play here, apart from all these positions that we might, you know, blah, blah, blah about. So, um, John, how about we start with you? And then Brad, let's get into the basis. How did you adopt and evolve your philosophy? Well, I guess I had studied economics kind of as a hobby <laughs> uh, for a long time, even when I, w I was young. I don't know why exactly I got interested in it. Uh, I read people like Hayek and von Mises, um, and they had a big influence on me. I got particularly interested in Rand's philosophy of objectivism. Uh, not that I'm an objectivist in, in totality, but I thought she had some very powerful ideas. And, and the philosophic basis is kind of trying to understand human nature and the nature of reality. And I, and I, I think that uh, I'll call them five basic principles. One is metaphysics in that nature is what it is. <laughs> we don't get to make it up. I, when I see a lot of economists, a lot of other people, they, they, they kind of want to wish <clears throat> uh, reality was different than it is. And I you can't do that. Reality is what it is. Secondly is epistemology, man's means of knowledge. Uh, and we have a very specific means of knowledge, how we gain knowledge uh, through the thinking process. Uh, basically by being able to separate and integrate. We can see things that are like each other and different than other things, and we develop concepts uh, based on that. And we build our world on our concept. Now we can be making mistakes because our concepts can be wrong, but we can constantly learn by comparing those concepts back to reality. So man is bound by nature, and he has a means of understanding nature, which is his ability to think. Uh, thirdly, I think as, as human beings, we are fundamentally uh, traders. We trade value for value. We try to get better. Uh, it, it, some people get greedy, some people try to cheat, but, but in general, we're in the business of trading value, value, value for value. And the smarter people and the better people and the more successful people in the long term just understand how to create win-win relationships, how, how to get better together. And that requires a freer society. Because if somebody else is making rules, some government bureaucrat tells me how I have to play the game, then it takes away many of my options, many of the possibilities that I might have. And that doesn't mean that some people won't cheat, and there aren't criminals, but I think the vast majority of people will play the game if you make the rules right that you create it, make it possible for people to create win-win relationships. So when I ran bb and we were in the win-win relationship business. We had a gut level commitment to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. And we expected to make a profit doing it. And it worked. <laughs> we made a lot of people wealthy and bb and was very, very successful. Um, so so you, you start with mother nature, you start with man's nature as a thinking being, uh, and what I would call his ethics is pursuit of trying to create a better world for himself, acting in his own rational self-interest, but in the process, helping other people. Uh, so I don't think you can act, purely act in your own self-interest. It, it just the world didn't work that way. <laughs> you can act in mutual self-interest. 
and 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 I think that I think those kind of foundational things were very important to me. So I studied uh, economics and business, and a lot and 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 frankly a lot of philosophy uh, from Aristotle on. Aristotle's my favorite, to tell you the truth, uh, and also a lot of psychology. Uh, my company bought a psychology business uh, that taught people what what we found is most arguments, and you see this a lot in intellectuals, you see this in college professors everywhere, they're what I call top of the head arguments. They're not really coming from a deep understanding of themselves. They're not very self-aware. And our philosophy programs taught people to become self-aware, to understand what was really motivating the positions they were taking, which often were not rational. Um, I give you a simple example. Um, my <clears throat> my mother is the kind of person that will uh, tell you that you know she likes what you're doing, but she really doesn't like it. <laughs> she she she's very kind of. I never uh, had that problem. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I got a lot of I don't like. It. Yeah. yeah, right. But um, what what that does is make you try to make her happy, but it's impossible. Because it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to make her happy. And so, you, if you, if you have that embedded in your personality, you'll try to make people happy. When they're not going to be happy, and you're not acting rationally consistent with your own values and your own beliefs. When you bring some of those kind of crazinesses that you learned as a child to the surface, you become much more of a rational thinker. And one reason our company way outperformed the industry is not because we had geniuses, not because people had higher IQs but because they were more self-aware and could make more logical decisions because they understood clear what the premise was of their psychological thinking. And psychological thinking has a huge impact on logical thinking. Logical thinking. And, and so we spent a lot of time, money, effort, and energy helping people become logical thinkers, but also helping them become self-aware so that they didn't fool themselves, uh, they were less likely to fool themselves. But, but if you think about that, now this goes back to the kind of environments you got to have. You got to give people autonomy to do their jobs. You got to give them freedom. If they're just, you know, if they're just like working as a government bureaucrat doing what they were told to do, they can't do that. So we had very independent thinking. We had very decentralized organizations. Uh, we basically help people responsible for their action, for the consequences of their action. But they had a huge amount of autonomy. Now they were trained extremely well. They weren't all geniuses, you know, we had smart people, but, but they were trained extremely well in logical decision making. Mm -hmm. And then they could choose or not choose to make those decisions, uh, and, but they would be held accountable. And what you get is far more innovation, far more creativity, and we killed our competitors who basically had a little box. <laughs> yeah, they had a big box, but they, they, you know, they had the rules that they had to follow that were pretty meticulous. And they looked like government bureaucrats. And when we dealt with government bureaucrats, it was a real struggle because they just have a whole bunch of boxes you're supposed to check. And we weren't good box checkers. We checked the boxes because we had to, but that wasn't what we were trying to teach people to do. That gives us, a, I think, a, a good sense for where you're coming in from and how you shaped others. Thank you. Brad, give us a sense for where your thoughts emerge from. Well, you know, I try to look at the world and listen to people and learn stuff. Right. But right now I'm thinking of a debate I saw between Milton Friedman and Amart Yassin, in which you know, Milton was um, always incredibly optimistic, you know, says that most of the time, it's a government which is established or is maintaining some kind of monopoly that keeps people from finding useful things to do. And because people are by nature ingenious and hardworking, you know, all you have to do is go to what John wants to say to try to clear the board and simply have the underlying order of property and contract and people will find useful things to do. And so you won't really have to worry about problems of income distribution. Um, to which Amartya responds with the Bengal famine. Um, 
three million people die because they can't find anything useful to do in Bengal in 1942 and 1943. And Uncle Milton responds by saying, well, that's exceptional. That's the middle of a war. Everything's incredibly disturbed. You can't expect the system to rejigger itself quickly. Um, and Amartya says, well, what good is a system that only manages to return itself to equilibrium after all these people have died? You know, that much better to have simply found a way for the government to give the poor of Bengal extra money in 1942-43 so that they could have made their demand aware on the marketplace. Um, or simply shipped had the British Army, the British Viceroy in Delhi, simply shipped the food out to Bengal and distribute it for free. That would have been a fine thing to do. Um, you know, you kind of are at least, I think, moved to that, say, toward John Maynard Keynes's position that the long run often comes much too late for a reliance on what's going to happen in the long run to produce a good or a functioning society. Um, we look at Purdue, we look at opioid deaths, we look at the opioid epidemic, and we think about the FDA's approval process, um, and we think about what the other gatekeepers should have done. You know, what people's doctors and neighbors should have done in the way of warning people about the dangers of overdoses. Um, and we conclude that people's information sources on this aren't terribly good, but that a profit-seeking corporation that can not just addict people um, and then kill them is perhaps the most dangerous of beasts to let out, you know, running through. There's a story of Warren Buffett talking about how great a business tobacco was to invest in because it was so extraordinarily addictive and it killed you only very slowly. And so you could make a huge amount of money um, from investing in tobacco. And on the side, you put a little bit of money to buy the legislators of Carolina um, to block government attempts to hurry up say, the attempt to fight tobacco addiction in America. Um, and you draw conclusions from that. Um, you look at the memories of the statue of Athena Promachos, and you say, on the other hand, there is no way that any centralized kingdom or centralized plan could have, back in 350 BC, of figured out how to get the resources to build a 90-ton statue of the goddess up on the Acropolis. And you think about that and you reflect on that. Um, you look, um, say, you look back at the difference between Australia um, and the United States and say, gee, um, what's the difference there? You look at what's happened to the United States employment rate over the course of you know, my adult life. Um, here we have the employment rate of people aged 25 to 54. Uh, people who are by and large too old to be in school, too young to be retired, um, overwhelmingly non-disabled. A bunch of them are taking care of kids, some of them taking care of elderly relatives, but that those social pressures change only very slowly. And we find these very interesting things that happen. Um, 2007 to 2009, when all of a sudden the fraction of 25 to 54 year olds who have jobs falls from 80 to 75%. And you ask them why, and a bunch of people say, well, I would really like to have a job now but I can't find one. Um, and somehow it takes nine full years for the market economy to figure out a way to get ourselves back to the situation of 2007, when the 80% of 25 to 54 year olds who typically want to have jobs in America actually manage to find them. You know, the economy was greatly deranged by the financial crisis of, 2008 and 2010 and entered the Great Decession, Recession. 
So, and every year from 2010 on, I heard from the Cato Institute that it was very important that the government not artificially stimulate the economy and put people back to work because the market would do the job. Um, and the market did the job. You know, it took it 10 years um, to do the job. Countries that acted more aggressively, that said that since the private sector has, stood, has fallen down on the job and has sat down and is no longer spending, it's a time for the government to spend to put people to work. Managed to recover from the Great Recession a lot faster and to have better working societies. So, um, Brad, if, I, if, I can, if, I can, if I can intervene for, for a moment here. So, it sounds like you've had a lot of observations, you've looked at a lot of data. And that's how you've cobbled together your worldview. I would say um, I've read, I've read, and been influenced by a lot of Hayek and a lot of John Stuart Mill. And mm -hmm. you know, okay, um, you guys both have students. When students come into your classroom, what would you love them to walk out of that classroom with? What would excite you if you could fill their minds with something? What would that thing be? Brad, how about we start with you on this one? Well, I kind of hope they walk out of economics courses with a very strong sense of how lucky they and we are to live in this day and age, this incredibly prosperous day and age, rather than in any previous age. The, how out a great society and economy we are lucky enough to be in the middle of and how we should treasure this thing and try to make it better. Mm -hmm. John? Well, I, I hope they'll get a, uh, if they haven't already gotten it, a deep passion for thinking for themselves. For being willing to look at facts objectively, not to be driven by the whim of what's in the newspapers or what they, you know, they hear on the internet, but to, to, to be objective, logical, rigorous, disciplined thinkers. And I would also agree with Brad to realize how right we have it today and that this this is uh, a phenomenally good time to live good time you to guys live. agree agree on that much let's talk I, about a book i want to wait one more comment on what brad said about the economic recovery coming out of 2008 yeah i was there <laughs> i was running the bank i think unquestionably the reason we were so slow recovering was obama's policies the constant series of government interferences in markets in decision making and, and just buried by new rules and regulations. Uh, the classic case is, is uh, the, the banking regulations increased, I think, 500%. And so instead of trying to run your business, you were out doing regulations. So the slowness of the economic recovery in the US, in my view, wasn't because Cato was <laughs> saying anything. It was because we were dragging along this massive increase in government interference because people were blaming markets for the correction we had just had. And that made the recovery much slower than it needed to be. And I, you know, I was there when we recovered in 1980. <laughs> yeah, I've been around in 1990, in the early 2000s. And I, and I saw how much faster those recoveries were. And this one, it was a regulatory burden across every aspect, particularly on the financial services industry, which drives a lot of economic activity. This rapid recovery here was primarily due to the fact that Reagan believed that the United States was greatly underarmed and that we need to greatly ramp up, ramp up the military budget um, in order to reinvigorate the Cold War. Um, that large expansionary fiscal policy made the difference between this here and this here. Um, but I'd agree that the um, so I say that in the aftermath of 2007, 2008, the mortgage, you know, the mortgage um, system was, in America, was broken. We didn't have housing recovery, right? Um, the fact that the housing sector took, never recovered from 2008, even though there were lots of people who wanted new houses by 2011, played a substantial role. And so I would agree with John there that 
allowing the mortgage financing system to stay broken um, was a major bad was a major bad thing done by the Obama administration. So let's let's talk a bit more about the essence of your philosophies, John. Mm -hmm. When people become leaders at BBNT, you have them go through a training where they read Atlas Shrugged. Help us understand what they're supposed to get out of that. And Brad, I'll turn to you after, and I'd love to know if you could have your people, your students, read any one book, what would it be and why? John? When I joined BB&T, it was a little farm bank. Uh, we were uh, one of the small, you know, like 350th largest bank in the U.S. We weren't doing very well. Uh, we needed a transformation, and fortunately, it was run by a bunch of old guys who didn't care and, and let some of us young guys transform. We created a a world-class training program and went out and hired people that were far too good for our bank in terms of their background, skills, education. You know, they, you wouldn't expect a bank that size to hire them. Um, one of the things we did require them to, to re I, I happen to mostly agree with Atlas Rugg, but not because we expected to agree with them. We just thought they needed something inspirational about entrepreneurship, inspirational about business, inspirational about capitalism. But so much of what you read is either what I call mechanical, it's technical, or it's just capitalism's really bad. It's, you know, we just have to tolerate it. We have to let it go. And, and we wanted our teams to be inspired. We encouraged them to read the, read the Fountainhead, but they also had to read lots of other stuff uh, that wasn't, you know, technical stuff, uh, um, and that wasn't inspirational. Uh, they had to read, you know, books on banking. They had to read books uh, for higher level uh, learning on accounting. We chose to spend much more on educating our our young people than our competitors did, even though we were much smaller. And over the years, we got a tremendously high payback. Many of those people became leaders in our organization over a 20, 30 year period. Um, and we kept that investment in education, we call it the BBT University. We probably spent, I don't know, 20, 30 times per person more in education than our competitors did all the way down to the teller line. Uh, and one of the consequences we got out of that is we had by far the highest level of client satisfaction of any major bank in America. When you have highly trained people, they have the autonomy to do the job, they have the freedom to do the job, and they're rewarded. We had very good reward systems for, for, for doing your job well. You get better payback. You get better higher level. Our, our productivity you know, per dollar revenue produced per employee, anything you measured, we were two and three times the industry average. Uh, and what one thing that enabled us to do was acquire lots of little banks and improve them. And, and we used Atlas Rug. We used uh, other books that we had put together on uh, banking to uh, encourage people to think. Uh, I required everybody in our senior leadership team to read one serious book every month. I did that myself. Uh, I was very interested in economics. I'm a huge fan of Von Mises and Hayek uh, and read everything they ever wrote and made sure our management team read everything they ever wrote. Not that they had to agree with it. They just had to, to read it and, and think about it. So we had a rigorous university process and we had a rigorous kind of ongoing educational process. Every job in the bank, you had to accomplish certain levels of knowledge to get advanced. If you, if you came in as an entry level teller, then you had to go through a certain series of training processes to get to be a senior teller. And if you got to be a senior teller and you wanted to be a relationship banker, there was some more training process. So it was a very rigorous training process but you got to do your job. You weren't micromanaged once you were master of your field of endeavor. And, and that was a real high payback activity. And uh, now I personally got a lot out of Atlas Shrug. I don't know how many of my employees agree with Atlas Shrug. For one thing, you know, Rand's an atheist. And Eastern North, we, start, we were in Eastern North Carolina farm bank to start with. There weren't many atheists around. <laughs> may not play so well down in the deep south. All right. <laughs> Fan fantastic overview of the role that book played in a broader education and, and personal development scheme that you, that you really invested deeply in. Brad, how about you? If there's one book that could excite or otherwise kind of bring out 
what you'd like from your students, what book would that be and why? That's actually a very hard, that's actually a very hard question to answer. Um, because, you know, most of, again, as John said earlier, most of what education should be about is learning to think for yourself um, rather than take on any one particular book um, or treatise kind of as a guru. Um, it very much depends. I'd say the book that people should read is the one that excites them the most at the moment and that makes them question um, what it is that they thought they knew um, the most, you know, at any one particular moment. Um, Intriguing. For some people can, I, that, can I turn that back on you? What, what book has that been for you? Oh, um, actually tempted to say an English book, um, Mimesis, written by a guy named Eric Auerbach in, who had fled to Turkey in the middle of World War II um, and wrote it there, all about how the fiction writers of Europe have tried to portray and imitate reality and portray and set out reality over the past 2,500 years and how their different views on what kind of, what were the important things of reality had greatly influenced at how they decided to try to write their prose in order to be convincing to their readers. Um, in social sciences, um, I would say that sometimes it's John Maynard Keynes general theory that plays, that's played a big role. I would say other times it's been Carl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, which I actually don't think most people should read because it has to hit you at a very particular point in time. Um, if you want a more general, the economics book I think that is likely to be the most exciting in terms that the most people are likely to absorb it and be stimulated by it and think as a result of it. I'd say it's probably my old teacher, Charlie Kindleberger's History of Financial Crises, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting hearing the, the books you turn to because on the one hand, John, you've got some Randian books, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged, and, uh, and Hidden in Her Repertoire is The Virtue of Selfishness, and there's uh, a deep theme around selfishness. Um, and then you take someone like John Maynard Keynes and um, well, in the long run, we're all dead, right? We have to wait way too long. Let's just, let's do, do things now and, and, you know, give unto society. Um, what you might consider more, more altruistic perspective. Um, what's the better approach? Selfishness or altruism and why? And Brad, let's hear your take on that. Well, where Ayn Rand is coming from is she's coming out of the Soviet Union. And she's seen an extraordinary amount of evil done by people who did evil in the belief or under the cover of the fact that they were being altruistic, right? That Lenin was going to drag Russia to a utopia, whether the Russians wanted it or not, you know. Um, and so I think in large part, she is very strongly reacting against that because she was not an overwhelmingly selfish person in her life. You know, that she ran a very interesting salon of people in New York of 1950s trying to educate people. Um, she was, I think, largely a preacher, um, that she tuned her books not so much to maximize her personal income, as because she thought she had important messages about human autonomy and agency and liberty to deliver. And she was going to deliver them through those books. And so rather than write the next book that would sell the most copies, she would kind of write the next book that she thought would most get her message through. So I would say that, um, 
even Ayn Rand is to a substantial degree altruistic, although she would have denied that, um, denied that substantially. Um, and that the key thing to recognize is that we are all fellow human beings who do care about each other. Um, but we got to arrange society so that we do not place too heavy demands on that altruism. Um, we've got to reduce the amount of altruism that we require of people in society to the amount that people can genuinely maintain and effectively practice. Um, rather than demanding that people be very altruistic, even their material interest strongly pushes them in another direction. Um, and, you know, I hear I'm pushed back to Purdue Pharmaceuticals um, or to Warren Buffett giving money to Carolina senators to try to delay regulation of tobacco. Um, that their financial interests were simply too strong for normal human kindness, um, normal human altruism, normal human fellow feeling. What Adam Smith called sympathy for others you know, to actually be effective. Mm -hmm. John, what say you? I pretty much agree with Brad. Maybe I, I would phrase it a different way. I, I think that people should act in their rational long-term self-interest. But I think that also, by implication, includes other human beings. <laughs> other relationships matter a lot. You know, my wife, my children, my friends matter a lot. So I don't think it's that you're purely isolated out there. Um, I like, you know, we started talking about this a little bit early on. I'm really a strong believer in doing everything you can to create win-win relationships. I think there's pretty much an infinite opportunity to figure out how to get better together. Not infinite. And, and, and I have found in any relationship, if I can work with, you know, it's hard when we're having a debate with Brad, but if we, if we hung around for a while, I think we could actually create some form of win-win relationship, not, not a perfect form of win-win relationship. But I, I'm for win-win relationship, and that's how we ran our business. Our goal was to help our clients be economically successful and financially secure, and we expected to make a profit doing it. And we never wanted to take advantage of anybody because we thought it would come back to haunt us in the long run. And, and I think when businesses do that, it does come back to haunt them on the long run. So, you know, and, 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 but I also think creating winning relationship requires a form of self-discipline for yourself. In, in, in the sense that you need to take care of your mind, you need to read, study, and think, you need to take care of your body, because uh, your body's where you live. Uh, you need to work hard to create those kind of relationships where you, you can. Uh, you know, they don't just happen automatically. So that the whole win-win relationship, it's actually kind of pushes a personal responsibility back to you to take care of yourself in a, what I would consider a positive manner. And I, I, I think that that is the key to happiness in my, my view. So and it's not about self-sacrifice. It's not self-sacrifice. But on the other hand, it's not taking advantage of other people. It's searching for where we can get together and get better. And in that process, a lot of times where I can learn and get better, even if we don't, if, if we don't, I'm learning some, Brad and I may disagree, but I've learned a lot from Brad. And, and that's good. You know, that's how he did have the unfair advantage when it came to graphs. You're, you're about a hundred to zero when it comes to brands. Yeah, you got me. Spread. I didn't know what we were doing. Right? Yeah, right. Here's a graph that John will like, right? Because here, this red line is housing construction in America with the zero being normal. And here we have the housing bubble from 2003 to 2006. Here we have the unwinding of the housing bubble. And by the end of 2009, you know, that all the extra houses we built during the bubble had been matched by houses that we did not build um, during the recession. And thereafter, kind of housing construction could, should have gone back to normal. And the amount of banking business done financing housing should have gone back to normal. Um, and yet, I think because of the misregulation of the housing finance sector by the Obama administration, you know, it did not. It stayed depressed for year after year after year after year, 
um, even though there were still all the people growing up and forming families who would normally have bought houses um, during the years from 2011 to 2014, you know, who couldn't because the government couldn't arrange the market, the housing financing market in such a way for those win-win transactions that we both want to see to actually take place and for the people who can build houses, actually building houses and selling them to people who want houses. Moving, moving to another kind of essential question here, mm -hmm. undergird, or, or undergirding a lot of this policy stuff, how much is, shall, should someone be entitled to what another person produces? Brad, you wanna tee off on that? Well, one view is that none of us produces anything that you drop me out in the Sierra Nevadas naked right now and I die. Um, that we have a 7.8 billion um, person division of labor here, which also has all the knowledge created by all those who came before us. That, you know, every time I write the letter A, what I'm doing is I'm using a stylized picture of an ox to represent a sound. And there was some guy back in Lebanon 2,200 years ago, um, let's call him Ishbal, who thought, hey, you know, I know how to make a better writing system. Instead of having pictures stand for things, I'll have pictures stand for sounds and I'll take this thing that is the head of an ox and it'll stand for the A and then it got turned upside down, which is why when the A, the ox's horns are pointing down rather than up, but it's still an ox's horns. That was a very good idea he had. Um, in some sense, we ought to pay him and his heirs for it. You know, we aren't. Um, we're simply standing on the soldiers of giants. Um, and in the fact that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, an awful lot of our productivity is due to those who came before and those who are around us. Um, or like my great grandfather could go to college because of income from the farm in Maine that his family had held for generations. Ever since they shot the local Indian chief, Poland, in the back in the 1750s, I think it was, and took the land from the Abenaki. Um, that has flown down to me. Um, you know, how much of what I produce do I owe to the Abenaki people of Maine? And should I be making reparations payments to them every month? Um, in some sense, clearly, yes. You know, my ancestors killed them and took their stuff and I have benefited. Have them. you made good on that? Have I made good on that? Um, not perhaps as much as I should. We've given some contributions. Um, but you know, the whole thing is, the whole thing of right and just and desert is entirely and completely tangled. Um, that what we want to have is we want to have people powerfully incentivized to do good, to do things that are useful for society. We also want to not have people wind up for no fault of their own in the situation of these people. Um, and in general, um, in general, I think more egalitarian societies are going to work better than less egalitarian societies. Because whenever the wealth distribution gets concentrated, you get a class of rich people who are too focused not on being productive and useful, but on figuring out some way to keep their stuff from being taken away. You know, Sam Walton was an absolute genius who created an enormous mechanism that distributed very high quality goods very cheaply to all of all American Walmart customers all over the country and greatly produced a lot of human happiness thereby. Um, Sam Walton's children are rich people who think that further episodes of economic change are likely to diminish their wealth. Um, and so they and their ilk are likely to be um, on the side of trying to freeze things where they are in order to retard future economic growth. 
you know, look at the role the Koch brothers have played in trying to stop the energy transition. It's something we need, it's something that's coming. And yet they had too much money invested in oil in the ground um, for them to be, will saying, to be willing to say, hey, we need to actually move faster um, on this if we want to keep the world from heating up too much over the course of the past hundred years. Um, you know, Brad, if we let you go on, I'm guessing you'd have bad. 10 stories and 10 graphs to show us. But OK, I think that gives us a pretty good graph, John. How much should, should someone be entitled to another person's production? Uh, I don't think you're entitled to someone else's production, but I think you're entitled to your own. And of course, I have a little bit different background than Brad. Uh, I uh, did, grew up in a house that didn't have indoor heating, they had a well where they got their water. My granddad, 12 years old, his dad died, and he made a living selling newspapers. So I came out of Nobody in my family had ever been to a university or ever been to college. And I was the first one that, that went to a university. Uh, and I joined bb and I joined at the very entry level and worked my way up to BC. Uh, I feel like I earned every penny I've got. I don't think I took advantage of anybody. I think I helped thousands of people be more successful, including thousands of bb and employees and thousands of bb and customers. So I think what the money I have is mine. Now, I don't, what am I, you know, I don't want to put it, put it, you know, in a sock or something. I'm very, my family's very generous. We give away to a lot of, of different kinds of charities. We support a lot of free market clauses like Cato, but also other, other ones. Um, but I don't, uh, yes, yeah, certainly I've benefited from living in a free society. Certainly I've benefited from living in the United States. But that's a, that's a very kind of spread out. <laughs> decentralized benefit that all that most people in the United States get. Um, so, um, yeah, I feel like I've earned every penny I've got. I'm glad to have gotten it. I'm giving a lot of it away before I die. I'll give it all away probably except some to my children. Uh, cause I don't think it's healthy for my, uh, my children to have it. I think I helped thousands of bb and employees become more successful and, and a lot of them grew up on dirt farms raising tobacco and are millionaires. So I have no apologies um, for what I do. I, I'm a big advocate of earned wealth. I agree with, with Brad a lot of times second generation is a mess. You see that in the banking generation and, and third generation, those people would be a lot better off without, with less money many times. Money can be helpful or it can be very destructive. You see a lot of alcoholics that are third generation wealthy. I mean, all over the place. And how, how about this egalitarian point, Brad, you made? You hear that a lot. And what is it we're after? It almost seems like the unassailable idea. But some people are talking about equal opportunity, some about equal results, some about equal rights. What, what do you have in mind when you say that, Brad? Um, well, it's very hard to have equal opportunity in one generation without having had something close to equal results um, in the preceding generation, given how much parents love their children and want um, to give them a leg up. You know? So you always wind up being an economist saying, we can't really get anywhere. Um, but what we'd like to do um, you know, we'd like to balance off a bunch of different considerations and get as close to having a society of, a wealthy society of opportunity um, and achievement, you know, and also accomplishment um, as we can. Um, you know, there is a very strong sense in which you know, like right here in California, two of our politicians have behaved very badly over the past couple months. Um, that is in terms of heading on up to this fancy ritzy restaurant in Healdsburg, California called the French Laundry in times when the California Department of Public Health and the Center for Disease Control was saying, wait a minute, um, go next year. You know, don't go this year. Um, the risks of infection are still too high. 
But you're supposed to be arguing for government. No, no. Not against, well, they yeah, were but, but is it equal opportunity? They spent, no, they spent 500. They not only broke quarantine, they also spend 500 bucks a person on dinner. You know, and if you make a habit of that, um, do you really get more satisfaction out of spending $500 on one dinner for yourself? Then if say you turn that $500 into 20, $25 gift cards to McDonald's and gave them out to harried mothers trying to control their children in the mall while they shop at someplace relatively cheap because they don't have a great deal of money. So is it, is it fair to say, Brad, you'd push toward equality of distribution or results? I would say I'd push that we, we want to have as equal opportunity and it would be very nice if that led to substantial kind of equality of outcomes um, as well. Okay. But, you know, equality of outcomes in the very long run. You know, okay. That I think that John is likely to be um, a better steward of how to give away a lot of his own wealth for the public good. Um, than a whole bunch of other mechanisms, which may include the legislature of North Carolina would be. John, what say you? What kind of equality, if indeed we're after that, are we looking for? Well, I am for a certain kind of equality. I think we should have uh, equality before the law. I think everybody ought to be treated with dignity and respect simply because they're a human being. But I don't think everybody's equal. Uh, I think that... Uh, some people uh, are smarter. Some people are hardworking. Some people have different goals and different different objectives. Um, so I don't think that we're, we're all equal. I don't think that's necessarily bad, by the way. <laughs> I just don't think that we're in fact equal. Uh, I use this story. Uh, one of my heroes was Michael Jordan, who was a great basketball player maybe, and, uh, at the University of North Carolina. Um, it's interesting, but I'm not as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. There's a serious differential in performance. Shocker. <laughs> I know, it's disappointing. <laughs> uh, what, what's, it, what's more interesting is I could never get to be as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. It's, it's not possible. You can't, you can't do it. I don't care how hard I tried and how hard you, you tried to help me. Uh, I can't be as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. Um, what I think, however, is that um, I don't have to be as good as bad. I, I, I'm as good as I am. And, and, and the only way to make Michael Jordan and me equal is to do something negative to Michael Jordan, you know, cut his legs off, <laughs> uh, do something dramatically negative to Michael Jordan, which I think would be an awful thing to do. Uh, I think that um, what we're trying to do is give people the opportunity to maximize who they are as human beings, given their own strengths and their own, their own weaknesses. Um, so I can't be as great a, Mike, a basketball player as Michael Jordan, but I can be lots of other good things because <laughs> of my strengths and, and my weaknesses, or I can be the best I can be. Uh, and, and so in sending human beings to enjoy their life from maximizing what they're capable of doing, is a whole lot more important in my view than how much money they make or how much power they have or this equal distribution stuff. I don't get that. I don't get that. My grandfather and grandmother were poor. They were happy people because <laughs> they'd earned every penny that they, that they had. In addition, at a deeper level, half the people are smarter than average. Half the people have better athletes than average. Half the people are better at, at art than average. The only way to make everybody equal is to reduce people down to the lowest common denominator. But you can't make the lowest ones great. You can make the great ones lower. And, and, and yeah, I, I use this story. I, 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 I was raised in a, in a church where the preacher wanted everybody to sing as loud as possible, except me. I am a terrible singer. It would be horrible if everybody had to sing as badly as I did. And I think that would be tragic. So I don't think the goal is really equality in that sense of the word. I think it's really opportunity to be the best you can given who you are and enjoy your life on your own terms. 
you know, I knew a lot of people at BB&T, a classic, you tellers and relationship bankers were a hot, happier than people making a lot more money because they love their job. They love the family situation they had. Were they equal? Well, yes and no. They, they didn't have an equal amount of money, but they had more happiness than a lot of people that had more money. So I think the whole question is a little more complex than people try to make it. It's not really just about money. It's about a sense of life, purpose, enjoyment, life, meaning. Well, th that's very gratifying because you're both a heck of a lot smarter than I am, and now I feel a lot happier about it. So <laughs> I have just one more question because you guys have brought a tremendous amount of perspective. And I see Brad's getting ready to tee up yet another slide here. My question is, for the CEOs and the leaders who are viewing this, what advice do you have to them on how they can help to bring about the kind of future you'd like to see? A future with good governance and a robust, positive future. Let's start there. John, with you, and Brad, you'd close up. Well, I'll start from an organizational perspective, and, and, and I'll call it a human perspective. I think the number one thing you can give a human being or or help a human being get, I don't know if you can give it to them. And the number one thing you need in an organization is a sense of purpose. I think people want to make the world a better place to live. I really I believe that very strongly. Not everybody, the vast majority of people want to make the world a better place to live. And one of the challenges of leaders is to create the kind of environment where people are working for you can make the world a better place to live. In, in our case, helping our clients be economically successful and financially secure. That's how we made the world a better place to live. And, and that's what we wanted to do. And I talked about that a lot, that at bb &T, our number one goal is to make the world a better place to live. No, we got to make money doing it. That's required. That's part of the game. But we want to make a difference in, in people's lives and enjoy doing it ourselves because we have the moral right to our own lives. So making people a better place to live, making the world a better place to live for other people and at the same time doing it in a way that we enjoy. The second thing I think, that I, I'm a strong believer in is reason. I'm an advocate of logical decision making, to analyze the facts and to act objectively. And that doesn't mean you have to be a genius. I'm not requiring that. But but you need to avoid evasion where you, you don't want somebody presents you with some facts and you don't want to hear them and, and you evade them. Uh, and you and you have to have a very active mind. One of my biggest challenges to our employees was to, to be awake. Be paying attention to what's going on because most people live a lot of their lives asleep. So you need a sense of purpose. You need the ability to reason rationally. And finally, you need to earn self-esteem from your work. Earn self-esteem from your work. And I, and, and I don't mean kind of artificial. I mean real self-esteem. And I think work is incredibly important in that regard. Something I said to the employees of BBT many times. It's very important to BB&T that you do your job well, but it's far, far, far more important to you. Uh, you might fool me about how well you do your job, but you'll never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, keep it impossible. If you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem. Here's the good news. Do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, can't do it impossible, and you will raise your self-esteem which is more important than whether you get a promotion or more money or more recognition because it's who you are as a human being. So you want to create the kind of organization, and I would say the kind of world, that's a bigger picture, where people have a sense of purpose. They use their logical, rational thinking ability to solve problems. And that in that process, they earn rational self-esteem so that they can be proud of themselves and can enjoy that. The, the end purpose in life is happiness. And I mean happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. Blood, sweat, and tears, happiness. Hard work, happiness. When you're 80 years old, you look back and say, man, that was tough. I'm glad I did. And I'm sure you, this program gives you some happiness, right? Doing this program. And that's yeah, the end goal of the game. Now, you're not going to get that every day, but you can't forget that the end goal of the game is happiness. For individuals, for an organization, I think bb &T had a much happier organization. <laughs> you know, not that everybody was happy every day, but because that was a stated goal. Was, hey, and, and our customers were happy because they, they dealt with that happy people. And I don't mean superficial happiness. I mean Aristotelian. Mm -hmm. All right, John, 
That is a lot to digest and probably a lifetime <laughs> of work, but worthy work, it seems. Brad, what can people do to actualize, to realize the kind of uh, good governance and, and healthy, uh, robust life you envision? Well, I would first say participate in our democracy. Um, that if history teaches us anything, it's that governments that aren't democracies, societies that aren't democracies, you know, crash and burn, um, crash and burn with great regularity. And governments that are democracies in which people do not take the democracy part of it seriously, in which people think that someone else is going to take care of the business of government, or in which people think that, well, gee, democracy is really not that valuable right now. You know, we should be focusing on something else. Um, or people who don't willing to put in the effort to think for themselves to keep democracy going. Um, such are the places in which democracy collapses, in which people lose it. And then they're in kind of a world of harm. Um, I would add that when you think about how, what you should do to try to organize your society, um, you know, a good society will be one that has the minimal amount of poverty. You know, here up here, I have a quote from libertarian philosopher John Stuart Mill from the, from the 1800s about how a world in which there is lots of poverty um, is one of drudgery and imprisonment. That only when people have enough social power to command resources. And I suppose also when income is equally enough distributed that people understand that all of the work that each of us does is useful um, and honorable. That the fact that some people get paid more than others is a combination of luck in the sense that you were born with the right kind of mind and body to do this job, is the sense of luck in that you're in a society that happens to value the particular, right, the particular excellences that you have rather than others, um, and luck in the sense of pure luck, um, that we are all human and we all deserve kind of good, law, good and respected lives. And furthermore, that we here in America right now have the luckiest people the world has ever seen. And we have an obligation to each other to do the best we can to try to keep this thing going. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a, to put a, a gross understatement on our discussion, a robust and incredibly spirited exchange. And if, the, if, if I can use a, a little market analogy here, if I give you my tea, Brad, and you give me your tea that we were talking about before this chat, we still only have one bag of tea. But if we exchange information, well, we get to hold on to it all. So we're the better for it. You guys, me, everyone viewing this is the richer and better for this. So tremendous thanks. I, I want to open it up to any closing points. If there's something, hard to imagine, you haven't already shared that you'd like to, to share with our listeners. John, you first. Brad, closing thoughts to you. I just enjoyed the conversation, uh, Josh. Very interesting, very thoughtful. Uh, Brad's obviously an intellectual that's uh, thought a lot about stuff, and I always enjoy talking to smart people, so uh, it was fun. I suppose I should thank um, John for employing Brink Lindsay and Will Wilkinson and several others at Cato during his tenure there, because they are people from whom I've learned an immense and enormous amount. Um, and I would also urge people to recognize right now that the economy now is only halfway back to normal after the shutdown you know, of the spring. And that I think it's important as we go forward in terms of demanding things of our government, of our leaders, of our elected politicians, that they have a plan and actually take action to get us back from here um, back up to here as fast as possible, as fast as the vaccines are rolled out 
and the dangers of catching the viruses from too close social contact diminish. We really don't want another thing in which it takes a full decade um, for employment and production to get back to normal, during which lots of people who could be doing useful work and want to do useful work and are looking for useful work somehow fail to find it, um, which is the story of the 2010s. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be hard to synthesize almost two hours of, of discourse here, but um, if I have to, um, Brad, it sounds like you've pointed to some really colorful and poignant um, travesties or tragedies throughout history, and it seems like the government has an important hand to play from your vantage point in alleviating those, whether it's poverty, the addiction example, inequality, or, or even the, the virus and its expansion. And John, it seems like there's maybe an orientation of uh, moving more toward rather than avoiding these catastrophes um, and with a reliance on the individual, um, things like you closed with, uh, a robust purpose, rationality, and self-esteem. It, it certainly seems like you attack this from different angles. It's a lot of food for thought. It's inspiring and for my vote, immensely illuminating. It's a tremendous honor and pleasure to have had you both for, for this long. Uh, profound gratitude to you both. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you.